Hello and welcome to Rise and Shine. I'm Abushan Gautam. On the morning of April 8, 1982, an Israeli professor made a startling discovery about a completely new structure of chemical crystals that would change the conception of the very nature of matter and challenge established science. He would have to fight relentlessly for a decade to prove that his theory was right, and rightly so, two decades later, he would go on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of what is now known as quasi-periodic crystals. We'll talk about what quasi-crystals are and its implications later on, but let me introduce you who that person is. The name of that professor is Dan Shuckman. Professor Dan currently serves as a distinguished professor at the Department of Materials Engineering at the Technion in Haifa, Israel. He is more recently involved in teaching technological entrepreneurship class to his students at the Technion, which is attended by hundreds of students every year. By now, the class has been attended by more than 10,000 engineers and scientists. Professor Dan has been advocating techno-entrepreneurship everywhere he goes and has played a crucial role in turning Israel, which is his home nation, into a startup nation. To learn about this and more, we have invited Professor Dan Shepman to our studio today. Welcome to Rise and Shine, Professor Dan. Good morning. All right, now let me kick off this conversation by talking about what actually brings you to Nepal. So what is the purpose of your Nepal visit? Well, here in Nepal, we now have uh, an important international conference, number 13 conference on quasi-periodic materials. Mm -hmm. The first one was exactly 30 years ago in France, in Les Ouches. And this time is uh, conference number 13. This is what brings me here, mm -hmm. but also the curiosity. I wanted to see Nepal. I've never visited Nepal. I wanted to see the Everest mountain and the Himalayas. And uh, altogether, I'm very happy to be here. Okay, what was the rationale behind choosing Nepal as the venue for hosting the, um, the 13th exactly. Quasi-Crystal Conference? What was the rationale behind, uh, the purpose behind uh, hosting Nepal as the uh, venue for hosting the 13th National Conference? You have, uh, you have invited us, practically speaking. Mm -hmm. There are scientists here who study uh, quasi-periodic material. You made an invitation and our committee mm -hmm. uh, accepted it. Okay. To understand more about what like quasi crystals are, let's go back to your glory days, shall we? Um, uh, how did you come about with the discovery of quasi crystals, and what kind of implications does it have in the modern world? Okay. In order to understand what quasi periodic materials are, we have to understand what crystals are. Mm -hmm. Regular crystals are materials which are solid, and the atoms in them are ordered, but they are also periodic. Mm -hmm like tiles on the floor. And all the crystals that have been studied for 70 years, from the day in which crystallography started to the day of my discovery, all the crystals, hundreds of thousands of them, were ordered and periodic. And this was the definition of a crystal. A crystal is a solid material in which atoms are ordered and periodic. And I have discovered a new class of materials in which atoms are ordered, but not periodic. Mm -hmm. They are quasi-periodic. This quasi comes from a mathematical equation, quasi-periodicity. They are crystals. There is nothing quasi in them. They are real crystals. Everything is fine, but the order is quasi-periodic rather than periodic. And this changed our understanding of the structure of matter. It also created a paradigm shift in the science of crystallography. Wow. And what kind of implications does it have, like in the modern world? Applications? Yeah. Okay. If you find a new class of material, immediately people start to study the properties. Mm -hmm. Electrical conductivity, uh, heat conductivity, surface energy, magnetic properties, optical properties, chemical properties. And once you find an interesting property, people think about applications. Mm -hmm. And so there are quite a few applications to quasi-periodic materials. Let me give you one application, maybe the latest application. You see, some of these quasi-periodic materials heat very fast when you heat them with an um, infrared beam. Mm -hmm. So, they take this quasi-periodic powder, mix it with plastic powder for 3D printing in wow. the 3D printing machine. And they heat the, uh, the powder, you know, you spread a layer of powder, another layer, come layer by layer. Mm -hmm. They heat it with an infrared beam. The infrared beam hits the quasi-periodic particle very fast. The plastic around it melts and you have a solid. Mm -hmm. And this is a very fast uh, process. Here's just one useful way to use it. 
In fact, um, you just told me that the tie you're wearing has some kind of association with quasi-crystals, isn't it? Yes. Well, this tie was made for me uh -huh. uh, by the Technion, my uh, university, when I was 70 years old. This is before the Nobel Prize. To celebrate my 70th birthday, uh, the design here is a, a design of a surface of a quasi-periodic material. Mm -hmm. And this is a very popular tie. Uh, I have given it to many presidents of countries and many prime ministers and other dignitaries. All right. Now, Professor Dan, tell me one thing. Like, how uh, did you go about from doing uh, research on quasi-crystals, more about like pure science, into something like you know, technological entrepreneurship? Yeah. How did that well, happen? I didn't move from one to the other. Uh, I did many things in parallel. I did science in parallel to teaching entrepreneurship. Why did I do that? I will explain. When I was a student at the Technion, the spirit of the Technion told us in many words, you'll be so good that when you graduate, everybody will want to hire you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I said, but what if I want to open my own technology business? How do I do that? The Technion did not teach how to do that. Mm -hmm. So in 1986, I was promoted to a full professor. Mm -hmm. And I said, now I can do whatever I want. And I remember my desire to listen to lectures on, quasi on, <laughs> on technological entrepreneurship. And I created a class for technological entrepreneurship. It's a very large class. In the first um, year, I had 800 students in my class. Wow. Only 600 students had seats. The rest were sitting on the floor. Nowadays, I have, as you have mentioned before, more than 10,000 engineers and scientists in Israel who took my class. And this is a large number for a small country of 8 million people. And, and by the, over this period of time, 30 years in which, and I teach it every year, mm -hmm. year by year. Over this period of time, Israel became a startup nation. Wow. We have many startups, you know. We have, uh, at any given time, 5,000 high-tech startups in the country. Well, oh. I mean, we read every day about like new innovations being done in Israel yes. through startup companies. Uh, how does the government there encourage uh, the development, uh, you know, the research and development through the startup companies? How does the government do that? Yes. Well, government has many roles and governments can really support uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. I can give you a few examples. Mm -hmm. Good ideas are supported by the government, by the chief scientists of the government. Um, you can get uh, a lump sum of money, meaningful sum of money, to develop your idea once it passes some committees. And if you are successful and you open a company which is thriving, you pay back that money. If you are not successful and you fail, it was a gift. This is one way. Government can open incubators. Incubator is a place, it's a lump sum of money to uh, create something from your idea, mm -hmm. and it has office help and an accountant help and so on. So a person has two years to accomplish his or her goal by money that the government gives, space that the government gives, and office help. And office help means many things, including good advisors. There's another one. Uh, governments can encourage foreign countries to invest. Oh in uh, startups in a country. And my country, my government did that uh, in, the late, in the early 90s, actually, by doing the following. And this is one clever thing that my government did. They said to the world, hey, come invest in Israel. You put 60%, we put 40%. Wow. We are partners. Yeah. And immediately, there was a flood of money coming into the country. Mm -hmm. The end of the story is more interesting, because after several years, Government said, okay, we are not needed anymore. Money flows in anyway. So they took the money out. They invested $100 million. They took out $140 million. Oh. In five years, they made 40% and created a wave of investment in the country. Oh, wow. Really uh, good to hear about that. Um, now let's talk about uh, Nepal-Israel relations. Uh, how do you, uh, someone, how do you, as someone from the non-political background, uh, view the relations between Israel and Nepal? Oh, I don't know much about this relationship. As you said, I'm not in politics. I assume the relationships are good. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an ambassador here. You have an ambassador in Israel. I met your, our ambassador here. 
Uh, he created some meetings for me, including pre meeting with your um, president. Mm -hmm. um, I think that... Yeah, uh, I mean, the reason why I'm asking you this is uh, because, like, how do you think can Nepal and Israel collaborate in the field of uh, science, in the field of research and development in the future? What are the possible areas of... Okay, you, know, uh, you have... Um, you have good, several good scientists in Nepal, they, and, and many of them visited Israel, many of them studied in Israel. So we, we can teach Nepali students, we can teach uh, in Israel uh, new technologies, new uh, sciences. But what we really want is your Nepalese people to come back to your country and develop science and technology here. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Israel cannot do. This is something that you have to do here to attract back the scientists. I have met several professors here uh, in the last couple of days who, who stayed here and did not go away. But I hear that many people from Nepal, after being educated abroad, they stay abroad. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we have uh, Nepal people staying uh, in Israel. Uh, I don't know anybody who stayed. They study, they go back. I don't know if they go back here. Oh, they go back to another country. That I don't know. What, what I was asking you is like, uh, what are the areas like, uh, you know, where Nepal can collaborate with scientists from Israel? Are there any areas? Do you see a common, uh, common areas uh, for possible okay. research? You see, there's no Nepalese science. There's no Israeli science. Science, science is global. Okay. It's the same science everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you have good people who can lead a good research, uh, they can make a joint uh, proposal with Israeli scientists, uh, get some money to do the study, and, uh, and then you start to study. And then the Israeli partner will come to work here, and the Nepalese uh, party will come to work in Israel. So this is done commonly among all countries in the world. Uh, we talked about how like, the Israeli government has come up with provisions and special plans to help you know, promote startups. Now, in countries like developing countries like Nepal, we necessarily do not have the resources, the kind of you know, provisions in place to encourage startups. Now, what steps should the Nepali government take in order to promote technological entrepreneurship among youths? Okay, this is a very good question. And yesterday in my talk, I, I elaborated it. But let me repeat what I said. The first investment is in education. You need every Nepali young man or women to have basic good education. Not only the people in the cities, also the people in the villages. Everybody should have basic education. Step one. Step two, you want to have good engineering and science education because it's the engineers and scientists that open new startups. Number three, you want to have good supporting uh, government policy. And when I say government, I mean the central government, province government, state government, city government, all levels of government mm -hmm. should support good education and should support entrepreneurship. You need free market economy. Some people tell me that this is neo-colonialism. Mm, yeah. I call it free market economy. You cannot run away from competition. There is no way. If you run away from competition and you protect your own people, you will always stay behind. Yep. You must compete. You must learn to compete. And above all, above all, no corruption. Corruption should be eradicated, stopped, limited. There's no country without any corruption, but it should be really, 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 really limited. You law system should take care of this. You talk about free market economy. Let's talk about uh, the foreign direct investment or the FDI. Uh, how do you think that the country uh, like Nepal can use FDI to encourage uh, research and development in the country and advances in modern science. Okay, um, you need good universities, mm -hmm. good research university. I, I'm not talking about colleges. Colleges are very good for education, but if you want to join the world of science, mm -hmm. you need good research universities. You don't need many. One, two, three. Start with limited number but give them the money to buy the equipment, to hire the best people, bring back Nepalese people to your country. They are educated in the United States or Europe. They are experts, bring them back. But they will not come if they cannot have the equipment. Exactly. All right? So you have to invest in equipment, in good building, good offices, good support system, and then 
with joint ventures with other countries or money from this country, support their research. It's, it's crucial. It's very important. Right. Um, I'm being informed by my producer that time is running out. Um, lastly, before we leave, uh, what advice would you like to give out to young Nepali scientists who are aspiring to bring a change in the world like you? Okay. Well, let me start earlier, a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to mention one thing. In order to have more people study science and engineering and want to study science and engineering, my theory is start early. Mm -hmm. How early? In the kindergartens. Start teaching science, real science in the kindergarten. I do that in my country. I have a, I have a television program which is called To Be a Scientist with Professor Dan oh. for first graders. I teach real science. First graders? There. First graders, wow. age six. I teach real science on television in Israel. And this is in order for young people to want to become engineers and scientists. Once they have it in their minds, they will try to be scientists and engineers. So this is, this is an important step. And of course, advertise it. Make your scientist model to imitate. Oh. Role models, make them role models. Make, make, you can make a television program on science yeah, and bring indeed. scientists here mm -hmm. and say, I am, I am a, physicist, a physicist, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. Look at me, here is a couple of experiments and so on. Yep. This will encourage people to come to science, to come to engineering, and this will really change the country. All right, uh, thank you so much for coming to our studio today and speaking to us. It was indeed an honor having spoken to you about everything. My pleasure. All right. All right, that was Professor Daniel Shetman, uh, a recipient of the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize in Chemistry and a distinguished professor at the Technion in Haifa, Israel. We talked about a range of things, actually, uh, the discovery and implications of quasi-crystals, the importance of technological entrepreneurship for a country like Nepal, and the lessons Nepal can learn from Israel with regards to technological entrepreneurship and scientific development. Well, that's it for me for now. Uh, keep watching Kandabut Television. Goodbye. <laughs>